All right, good evening again. Um, I have, so I've received a couple of questions, but the first one that I received this month uh, was a, a bigger, broader question that basically amounts to like three questions. Um, so this is going to be the one that we're covering this month. Um, if, I, if ever I am in a discussion, do you know how Catholicism gets around or justifies themselves with Matthew 23, verse 9, Ephesians 4, verse 5, and 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. I'm not asking for an in-depth study of each verse. My basic question is how do they justify themselves when the word clearly states that they are wrong? All right, so my plan for tonight, this is going to be uh, maybe a little different than a typical Q&A. This is going to be more like a, an apologetics Q&A. This is uh, learning, all right, well, what is... What's the perspective that uh, the, some of the denominations take on certain things? Uh, because this is the kind of thing that will equip us to be able to talk with our friends and neighbors and coworkers. Um, in this case, particularly our Catholic ones, um, because it's like, um, well, think of it from our perspective. Um, if you have, if you've ever talked with say like a, a hyper Calvinist, you know, a hyper faith alone uh, Calvinist who thinks that baptism is a human work and that uh, that works are not necessary for salvation, right? They've they've got their list of like gotcha verses, right? I don't know if you've ever had these kinds of conversations, but there's like a stock list of verses that they'll throw at you, and it's like. Some, it, sometimes it seems like they think that you don't know that that verse exists and like you've never thought of it, right? Sometimes, on the flip side of that, we tend to do the same kind of thing with certain verses in other groups. Um, and so they have, uh, there's a lot to find on each of these verses because these are objections uh, that they hear all the time. Um, so for my, my plan for tonight is to take each of these passages in turn and consider what kinds of answers Catholics will typically provide. Um, and it should be clear, but I'm just going to say this out loud anyway at the outset of this study, just so that there's no confusion later on. And, or I, and I can, if there's any confusion later, I can point back to this and say, look, I said this out loud. You must not have been listening when I said this. But my sharing... Catholic explanations of these passages is not me agreeing with their explanations of these passages, right? I'm not, I'm not teaching Catholicism from the pulpit, as it were. Um, and, you know, if, if some of these explanations, you might think, well, how on earth can they believe that? Ask them. <laughs> There's, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you the explanations uh, as best as I can. Um, and if you go, know, that's, that's dumb, that's crazy. Well, spend some time thinking about it. Uh, it's, it's not my goal, also, to go really deep um, into the rabbit hole on each of these. Uh, because here's the thing. If you, in all of these discussions, all three of these passages we're going to look at, if you're sitting across from somebody who is reasoning with you in good faith, each of these discussions will eventually take you down the rabbit hole. And you will end up discussing 50 other things um, and it is not my goal, it's not within our ability together tonight to go down all of these rabbit holes, chase down any of the side tunnels. I will try to tell you things that might come up in certain discussions, just as kind of a heads up. Um, right out of the gate, one of the themes that you will notice in all three of these passage discussions is the Catholic concept of apostolic succession. Are you all familiar with apostolic succession? You know what that means. It's a, okay, this is, this is like Catholicism 101, and it is one of the fundamental disagreements that we have with Rome. And most of the other disagreements that we have with them are downstream of that. They ultimately, if you trace it back, it goes back to apostolic succession in one way or another. So here's what apostolic succession is. It is the idea that the role of the apostles did not end with the apostolic age. That the apostles appointed men to follow after them. 
So in, in this conception of things, uh, Timothy, for example, uh, would have been the successor of Paul. Um, and so Paul, in the Roman way of looking at things, Paul is not just sending Timothy as a, a minister, um, but that eventually Timothy becomes vested with the full authority of an apostle. And so after the first generation of apostles die, whereas in our way of thinking, all right, that's, that's the apostolic age, and that age comes to a close whenever all of the apostles have gone on. Um, and what the apostles are replaced with um, is basically the eldership in each individual church, and that's what governs the churches. Uh, in the Catholic way of understanding things, uh, they think that the, the ministry of apostle continued and still continues, um, and that's where the modern priesthood comes from. Priests and bishops in the Roman Catholic Church uh, are successors to the apostles, and they will be able to trace back, um, you know, this bishop was ordained bishop by this other bishop who was ordained bishop by this other bishop, and they'll trace their lines all the way back, and they claim to be able to trace unbroken succession all the way back to the first century. Um, now, we'll see how that ties in in each individual case. Um, but that understanding that the priesthood holds the office of apostle, I think ultimately explains a lot about the Roman Catholic way of thinking about all kinds of things. Um, so let's start with our first passage, Matthew 23, verse 9. Matthew 23, verse 9. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Um, this is one that they get pretty frequently. Uh, how can you call a priest father whenever Jesus says, call no man your father on earth? Um, in my experience, it's not uncommon for Catholics to assume that all of the Protestants that they talk to are hyper-fundamentalists and hyper-literalists. And so don't be surprised if you're talking with a Catholic friend and you, if you bring this up, uh, they will come back at you with something like, well, do you call your own dad father? <laughs> uh, and I have, I have seen some who then try to take the discussion toward uh, well, whether or not you should honor your biological father and mother, you know, which the scriptures command us to do. Um, and they'll do this with other honorifics that Jesus mentions in this passage. Um, let's see. You know, it, it, in that context, he talks about uh, not calling others teacher, not calling others master. Uh, they might point out that Paul refers to himself as a teacher in the epistles. And that the word doctor is just the Latin word for teacher. And that mister and missus mean master and mistress. And well, do you call, you know, do you call your doctor doctor? Do you politely address people as mister and missus? You're violating this passage if you think that I can't call my priest father. Um, and, and they'll, again, they'll ask you if you're being consistent with yourself or if you're just biased against Catholics. Now, this is, this is the absolute bottom of the barrel response that you will get. Um, and it's pretty easy to respond to. That, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> whenever, uh, that's not what Jesus is talking about. Whenever he says, call no man your father on earth. So I don't want to dwell too long on that one, but that is something that might come up. Um, a more serious Catholic, and this, is, this will generally be the case, by the way, a more serious Catholic will respond using the scriptures. Um, and in our caricature of Catholics, we think, wow, they, they don't even know what the Bible is. Um, the, the unserious Catholics are that way. Yeah, but what even they themselves call cultural Catholics, or in some cases, cradle Catholics, 
right? People who are, are Catholic just because their family's always been Catholic and they were baptized Catholic as infants and they were just always raised that way and that's the only reason they're Catholic. Um, even a lot of other Catholics consider those kinds of Catholics not to be serious Catholics. Uh, more serious Catholics understand that when they're talking with other people, uh, people outside of the Roman Catholic Church, about matters of the faith, that they need to appeal to the scriptures. Um, and so let's, let's consider what kinds of things they will point to in this case. Uh, they will point out that there are several places in the New Testament that characterize spiritual relationships in terms of parent and child. Uh, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Corinthians 4, 15. For though you have had countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Um, John acts similarly in his epistles. In fact, John is... This is... Uh, this is like a stylistic mark of John. Like if you were if you were given a text as like a blind taste test, you can tell it's John if he writes this way. Uh, for example, First John chapter two verse twelve. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for His name's sake. John absolutely loves to call the people that he's writing to his children. Does it all over the place in his epistles. Um, or Paul again in Galatians chapter 4 verse 19. He doesn't do it as often as John does, but he does do this as well. My little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Or Philemon verse 10. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. And so their answer will be essentially... That they're merely recognizing the spiritual fatherhood exercised by priests. Um, and this is where we need to make sure that we actually understand our own objection. Do we, and we've been talking about this in our Matthew class, um, in, in talking about the Sermon on the Mount. Do we think that Jesus is going about establishing a, a list of taboo words, like, like fool, in, in Matthew 5? Um, or in this case, in Matthew 23, father, or master, or teacher. Let us consider the context of Matthew 23, verse 9. <coughs> Excuse me, we're not going to read the whole chapter. We, we do, absolutely do not have time to do this. Um, but Matthew chapter 23 is the woes to the scribes and Pharisees. And just to broadly characterize the, that whole speech, Jesus is condemning the Pharisees' practice of seeking public honor and elevating themselves above, uh, above others, among other things. Um, and it's in that section that he talks about these honorifics, father, master, teacher, or rabbi. Um, your translation probably might preserve uh, that word rabbi instead of teacher. Um, our objection is not that we deny that there is such a thing as a teacher. Right? Teacher is one of the offices appointed by God. Paul tells us that in the epistles, at least in two places, that God appointed some to be teachers, etc. Um, it's not that we deny that there is such a thing as spiritual fatherhood. Our objection is to the way that the Roman church treats the priesthood, and especially the way that a lot of the laity uh, treat the priesthood. Um, the, and dis so this is, this is a good conversation to have with somebody, because they will probably protest this and say, no, we don't, we don't really elevate the priests. And... Yeah, this, is, this is where you can have a good, honest conversation <laughs> with them. It's like, okay, have you seen y'all's vestments? Right? Do you know what vestments are? Like the, the special clothing that the priests wear uh, whenever they're officiating the Mass. Have you seen the, uh, uh, the procession 
of the priests and deacons leading into a mass? Have you seen just all of the pomp and circumstance that goes into all of this? Um, our objection is to their elevation of the priests, which we see as an error similar to the error of the Pharisees. If Catholics merely mean to acknowledge that their priest is a spiritual guide, why are we formalizing that as an honorific? Right? Try, try addressing, if you're a Catholic, try addressing a priest at, at, using something other than father and see how long it takes before someone corrects you on it. They expect the honorific. Uh, in some cases, demand the honorific. Right? Why make a show of the priesthood? Why not apply the title of father to others? Right? By making it into a formal honorific, they're doing the thing that they themselves recognized was wrong with the Pharisees. Is this, Catholics get, like when it, at least some of the ones that I've talked to and some of the things that I've read, they acknowledge what's wrong with the Pharisees. They just don't think that they themselves are guilty of it. And that's one of the discussions uh, to have with them. Now, again, taken far enough, uh, this, this is going to end up taking you back to apostolic succession. Because if you believe that your priests are the successors of the apostles, right, that you are actually talking to an apostle, um, it, it makes things um, it, it makes sense why they elevate the priesthood because they consider them to be heirs of the apostles. Um, and sometimes they'll even take the, the discussion in that direction themselves. Right? They'll bring up Matthew 10, verse 40. Whoever receives you, talking Jesus talking to the apostles, whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me, that is, the Father. And so they'll say, well, look, the priests are apostles. Whoever receives the apostles, the priests, receives Christ. Whoever receives Christ receives the Father. And it's appropriate to refer to the heirs of the apostle as Father. That's... I know, that seems like a stretch, but that is an argument that I have seen from them. Okay, so that's Matthew 23, verse 9. I'm going to leave it to you, by the way, because we've, we are under a time crunch this evening. Um, I'm going to leave it to you to consider, well, how would I answer that? So I think this is a good exercise for each of us to be involved in. How would I respond to a Catholic who brings up these examples of spiritual fatherhood in the epistles um, and who claims that they're not really elevating the priesthood the way that the Pharisees were elevating themselves. How would I answer that? Um, now, if you come away from that, think, I don't know how I would answer that. We could do some follow-up classes to this. All right, I'm not going to leave you hanging in the breeze, as it were, uh, but I think it's a valuable exercise. Any any questions or comments about this particular one, Doug? Thank you. You know this was my question. Thank you. Yeah. It has always been obvious to me that sorry. It has always been obvious to me that mm -hmm. Catholicism seems to think when Jesus said, "Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven; whatever you loose on earth will be," they think that mm -hmm. applies to them. Yeah. Whereas you and I see clearly. Jesus was speaking to his inner circle of guys then, mm -hmm. not for 2,000 years ago right. from then, yeah. any guy who claims to be a man of God right. gets that privilege. No, Jesus was talking to his inner circle of yeah. guys. Okay, you and I see that. Right. They can't see that. They actually think they have the right to change the rules as they go. Yeah, and this is where, again, it, it comes back to that difference in, in understanding the nature and the scope of apostleship. That, that comes right back to apostolic succession, because a Catholic would, would hear you say that and say, well, yeah, in the context, he addressed the apostles, but then those apostles appointed heirs, you know, successors after them, and it applies to them too. 
so this is where um, it, I don't know that I've ever had a really successful conversation with a Catholic on that particular point because it's such a fundamental thing. But for the sake of our own understanding, we need to we need to know that that's where the disagreement happens, and that's where you're going to come back to every time. But yeah, you're you're absolutely right. All right, Wayne, I saw your hand. Why can't why can't you bring up? the scriptures that prove that we are all priests of God. Yeah. That there is no elevated priesthood, but we are all priests of God. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be the way I would go about it. Yep. It's not this special people over here, but mm -hmm. everybody is included. What would they say about that? So... Like I said, we don't have enough time to trace it to, to chase down every rabbit hole. That is something that they are familiar with, though, the, the idea of a priesthood of all believers. Um, they're familiar with the, the passage from that's that's first Peter. Is is that correct? I don't remember off the top of my head. I'll pull the Hebrew writer thing and say someone somewhere said that we are a nation of a holy nation of priests. Yeah, royal priesthood. Yes, sir. We got a microphone coming around for the sake of the hearing impaired. One of the things it's important to remember when you're studying with Catholics is they do not use solely the scriptures as the authority. Right. It's very important to understand that it, it's not only just the scriptures, but it's tradition. Yes. And magisterium or their interpretation of the scriptures as well as papal decree. Yes. So it's very challenging. It is. I, I came out of the Catholic Church as a youth, mm. and it's very challenging to study with Catholics because the way you've got to start is you've got to start saying, we're going to study the Scriptures. We're not going right. to talk about tradition. We're not going to talk about what the Pope said or, or so on and so forth because the Pope is a man and he's fallible. We have to get a basic understanding before we're going to be successful in studying with Catholics. Yes. Yeah, and that is... I think one thing, like a, a general principle to remember, is that a uh, along those lines, a Roman Catholic is going to trend towards historical arguments. And we want to trend towards doctrinal arguments. Um, and actually, I think the... Yeah, the, the next text, I think, is going to display that pretty clearly. Let's go ahead and go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. Uh, we'll go ahead and get this in the context. Uh, we'll start in verse 4 and get the whole sentence. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. All right, so. Now, this one immediately takes you down the rabbit hole. Because... You know what basically every Catholic is going to say whenever you read this text to them? They're going to say, yeah, you're right. That's why you should become Catholic. <laughs> you're absolutely correct. Now, that's, that is the very short answer to how do they justify themselves, because they, they conceive of themselves as the one true church founded by Jesus Christ. Yeah, and that, I was about to say, that shouldn't come as a surprise to us. All right, we should not be surprised uh, whenever we hear any denomination, you know, any person of any denomination, claim that its own roots go back to the earthly ministry of Christ and the Pentecost. Uh, they all claim that. Um, and many of them, including the Catholic Church, are eager to point out the later historical roots of every other denomination, uh, or ones that they think are denominations. Right, so 
in, in having a conversation with a Catholic, you know, we, we might turn to Constantine right, as the beginning of the Catholic Church. An educated Catholic would try to turn the tables on us and portray Alexander Campbell and the, the American Restoration Movement in the 19th century as the true origin of the Churches of Christ. And that's why, like we said just a minute ago, it's important to bring people around to questions of doctrine rather than to historical questions. Uh, in fact, I think, so I, I planned on saving this for only if we had time. And we don't have time, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, let's see. Like we said, with apostolic succession, it is fairly common for Catholics to boast an unbroken line of succession from the modern day all the way back to the apostles. It's an historical question. Now, let me throw a, maybe, I don't know, maybe this is a curveball. In one sense, it must obviously be true. It's also obviously true for us. And let me explain what I mean. How did I enter the faith? How did I become a Christian? Even if you don't know like, the personal story of how I became a Christian, you, can probably, like, you probably know how I became a Christian. The same way everybody else becomes a Christian. Right? Somebody baptized me. Somebody taught me the faith. How did that man enter the faith? Same way. Somebody taught him. Somebody baptized him. And so on. All the way back to the apostles. But Caleb, what about the two random guys who landed on an island and a Bible happened to be there? They had never heard of the Bible, but they read it. Then they've gone back to the apostles. <laughs> right? Like if, they, if, the, if the two guys on the island are reading the New Testament and discern from the New Testament every article of the truth that we subscribe to and are baptized, you know, immersed in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins... Where did their faith come from? It comes from the apostles. Right? For, a, for a normal person, there is this historical chain that leads back centuries, millennia. Eventually, and I don't know the chain in my case, but one way or another, just like I've got some kind of genetic lineage that goes back to the, the first man in my, in my line, I've got some spiritual lineage that goes back to one of the apostles. Who it is, I have no idea. doesn't matter. Right? Remember, we don't, we don't do this, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Right? Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians. And we can frame this, again, it, in terms of baptism. We can frame it in terms of teaching. Um, now, uh, let's see. Oh, yes, here's the point. That chain exists for every single person who claims to be a Christian, even if just on the level of hearing about Jesus. How did so-and-so hear about Jesus? Somebody told them. How did they hear about Jesus? Somebody told them. We're not saying that every person who claims to be a Christian is a Christian. We're not drawing some kind of equivalence between error and truth here. But it should be self-evident that everyone who claims faith in Jesus must have learned it from someone who learned it from someone else, who in turn learned it from someone else, all the way back to the apostles. Now, here's the point. What is the result of those lines of descent? If we're just relying on those lines of descent, where does it get us? Has it been one church that teaches one faith and one baptism? No, the result has been however many tens of thousands of denominations there are today. Right now, at, you, at this point, your Catholic friend will likely object that what you're describing is not true apostolic descent because most of those cases don't involve valid holy orders. And holy orders is how they refer to the appointment of deacons and priests and bishops. Um, Let's, I, before I dig into that, Doug, I saw your hand. I'm, I'm about to get My on another question role. with that verse is the yeah. one baptism yeah. of example. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how they get themselves around to justify such a gross misinterpretation of a perfectly... It could not have been worded 
in a more clear way. Mm -hmm. The only one who did not need baptism was baptized anyway, and he came up out of the water. Uh -huh. it, the, ex, the description of how he was baptized cannot be clearer. Okay, so yeah, how do they, they come to sprinkling and pouring? And not one example in the entire New Testament of an mm -hmm. infant being baptized. Mm -hmm. Yet with those examples, they go, oh, we just want people in the Catholic Church, so we'll sprinkle some water on them when they're, as soon as they're born. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. I, it boggles my mind how they came up with that. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to think if I've got good, short, off-the-cuff explanations for that. Um, the, when it comes to effusion, which is what they call pouring, as Catholics practice baptism um, by immersion, but mainly by pouring, um, because most of the people that they're baptizing are infants. Um, they came to that... Um, Again, it's an historical question. The reason that what they would say to justify that is they would go back to the Didache, um, which was written in the early second century. And in the Didache, it lays out the standards for baptism, which in at almost every point agrees with what we understand to be the truth from the scriptures, except at the very end of that paragraph on baptism, it says that if you don't have enough water for a baptism, and if you're pushed to it, you can pour water over somebody. Right. And that's from that, Catholicism has down through the ages developed that into a norm. That's, that's the short answer, is that pouring starts as an emergency exception in the Didache in the early second century, and by today it you know, becomes a norm. Did you have a, a yes. you probably have a better answer to that yes. than I do. Uh, it, it's, it's actually quite simple. Yeah. When you build a, a house of cards, you have to back into things. Yeah. The Catholic Church is, believes in original sin. Yes. Okay, that's not a concept that's scriptural, but the Catholic Church believes in original yeah. sin. And that's where the infant baptism if comes If you from. believe in original sin, you must then do an infant baptism. Yeah. If because I take little Charlie to, yeah. there and dunk her in the water, that's pretty cruel. Mm -hmm. and, and typically, a baptism of a Catholic infant is done at seven days. Right. But um, so if we do that, then we must pour to baptize. And then we have to add something later on. And, and so in the third grade, they're confirmed. Right. And, and so on and so forth. We just add error upon error upon error to yeah. cover up a misconception we started. With. Yes. Yeah. And that is that's the short answer to why infant baptism um, is they believe that every person from conception is stained by sin. And so if an unbaptized child were to pass away, uh, there, it, it's, it's like our brother is saying, it's it, error upon error. At one point, um, so some of the bolder ones would have said, oh, they just go to hell. Um, they just, I mean, they understood the consequences of their theology. Oh, yeah, yeah, those unbaptized kids, unbaptized, you know, six-month-old, Hell, that's it. Um, now, over the course of time, they've come up with the doctrine of limbo, which is a whole other rabbit hole to go down. Um, but that's where, that's, uh, that's how you can have babies not go to heaven, but also not go to hell. Um, so, now, I, I, wanna, I wanna build off of something that our brother mentioned um, concerning the, the infant baptism. It's actually gonna segue us into what I wanted to uh, to point out. This is this is a good way to get your Catholic friends to start questioning the validity of their thinking. Um, right? We ought to we ought to have a firm stand in terms of look everything that I am getting I'm getting from the scriptures. Right? That's this is the standard for truth. I'm not going to appeal to anything else. At the same time, we have to also be able to talk to or at least address the kinds of claims that they're coming up with. And one thing, it, it does help to know a little bit of church history, um, because if you've got a Catholic friend who is saying, well, look, 
you know, we know that we're the one true church because we have priests who are actual heirs of the apostles, and we can trace their line of succession all the way back to the first century. Simply point to the existence of Eastern Orthodoxy. And I don't know if you all know anything about Eastern Orthodoxy. It's going to tie into what we were saying about infant baptism a minute ago. Bring up Eastern Orthodoxy to show that this question, the historical question of succession, is not sufficient to determine who the one true church is. Because um, you can simply ask your Catholic friend whether Rome accepts the validity of Eastern Orthodox holy orders. In other words, do, do they have valid priests in the Eastern Orthodox Church? They do, by the way. The, the, the Rome teaches that the Eastern Orthodox have valid holy orders. So in other words, the Eastern Orthodox Church, they claim, has the same line of succession that they do. They, they consider those orders to be valid unconditionally. So if your friend tries to say no, well, they're just not well educated in the beliefs of their own church, which happens. Um, well, then you can spend some time discussing whether those two churches constitute one faith. How can they both have valid holy orders and both be the one church of Jesus Christ when there are plainly two of them? And it gets at the root of trying to build your concept of what is a valid church on this historical question of succession. That it is, as we've characterized it, a house of cards. Um, and these two churches differ substantially in many matters of doctrine. If your Catholic friend disagrees, there's a couple of things you could ask them about. You could, to take it back to what we were talking about earlier, ask about baptism. Because, you know, it, we, we were talking about uh, pouring being a necessity whenever you're baptizing infants. The Orthodox don't think so. The Orthodox, uh, instead of baptizing at seven days, they wait until 40 days. But they baptize their infants by immersion, by triple immersion. So they're not just dunked once, they are dunked three times. And if you've never watched an Orthodox baptism, you should look it up. There's videos. It's, you really ought to, it's something. You've, you've never seen anything quite like an Orthodox baptism. Um, that's, that's not one baptism, like, like you're pointing out, Doug. Um, you could ask them about the Great Schism. You could ask them, oh, this is where I ought to have brought the whiteboard up. But you can get, it's guaranteed to get any Catholic or any Eastern Orthodox really riled up. Just say the word filioque. It's F-I-L-I-O-Q-U-E, filioque. Uh, don't have time to explain it. Look it up. Uh, but this is that was one of the major causes of the Great Schism between Rome and the Orthodox. And there are lots of other Catholic dogmas that the Orthodox consider to be heretical. Um, the Immaculate Conception, Purgatory, the Papacy. Again, I bring all of that up because and it it points out. That look, you, what you have built up, you know, Roman Catholic friend, what you have built up as, <clears throat> excuse me, your reasoning for understanding your church to be the one true church, it is a house of cards. And all of this gets around again to what we mean when we say that we're the church founded by Jesus Christ. When we say that, we are not making an historical claim. Uh, maybe that sounds counterintuitive. But when we say that we are the church founded by Jesus Christ, we're not making an historical claim. We are making a doctrinal claim. We are the church of Christ because we follow the doctrine of Christ, delivered by Christ himself and by his apostles and his prophets as recorded in the New Testament. That's what makes us the church of Christ. And by the way, we, we don't make any kind of exclusive claims to that because that's denominationalism. And what I mean by that is that any church that follows the doctrine of Christ is the church of Christ. They don't have to have any kind of historical ties to the American Restoration Movement. Right? They don't have to be a Stone Campbell church. They have to obey the instructions of Christ and his apostles and prophets as recorded in the New Testament. 
That's what makes the church that Jesus founded. That's the whole meaning of our appeal to the Scriptures alone. And that is what we mean when we say that there is but one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Okay, any final questions or comments about that? All right, I'll say a brief word about 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. I know we're drawing long here. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. I might have to pare this down a lot, I think. All right, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. All right, now, I'll be honest, there's, there's at least three different directions that I could think of this going, and I wasn't sure exactly which one you were thinking of, Doug, so I picked one and went with it. <laughs> um, but the, uh, I'll, I'll just list out the objections. Whenever we read this verse, uh, that there is one mediator between God and men, well, what do Catholics do that we see as a violation of that? First off, there's the sacrament of penance which is the, the idea that you have to confess your sins to a priest uh, in order to receive absolution for those sins. Uh, we consider that to be a violation of this passage. Um, prayers to the saints, we also consider to be a violation of this passage. And a lot of the Marian doctrines in Roman Catholicism, their doctrines about Mary, violate this passage as well. Um, there's... And we absolutely do not have time to hunt all of those down. Um, so, like I said, I picked one and went with it. I picked uh, the, the sacrament of penance. Um, there's, I tell you, let me start by throwing maybe a bit of a curveball here. I'm going to start my answer by reading from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 480. Jesus Christ is true God and true man in the unity of his divine person. For this reason, he is the one and only mediator between God and men. So this is what Catholics have written in their own catechism. Now, obviously, the conversation has got to get deeper into what exactly it is we mean. So if they themselves are confessing in their own catechism. Yeah, the, the one and only mediator between God and men is Jesus Christ. Then we know that our conversation needs to go further than that, because obviously they think that their system of doing things doesn't violate that. Um, let's see. So, in talking about the sacrament of penance, which we commonly call confession, we object to two ideas. That a Christian must confess their sins to a priest, right? that confession to God alone is insufficient, and we object that, uh, to the idea that a priest has it within his power to absolve someone of their sins. And this is an area where the Catholic justification for things gets really lengthy. Um, and again, it comes back to what we've been saying. This, here's the house of cards in full display. We've, we've got the city of cards <laughs> built up here. Um, to do all of this explaining. And here's where I, I actually do have to get the whiteboard for this um, because I'm going to have to leave you with some homework or else we're going to delay my speech till midnight and one of y'all is going to fall down and die. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so... Um, it, it, when you look at the catechism, which by the way, you can get used printed copies of the catechism for like five or ten bucks. It's also available, it's in the public domain, you can get it online, you go on the internet and look any of this up, get it for free. Easy to look up. Um, they categorize everything by paragraph number. And every, every article of their catechism, at the end of it, has a summary. Uh, what they call in brief. So if you want to know in brief what they believe about this and why, you're going to look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraphs 1485 through 1498. If you want the full-blown explanation of things, then you can read all of Article 4 of the Catechism, 
which is paragraphs 1422 through 1484. Um, so for our sake tonight, I'm only going to read two paragraphs, and I'm going to read the scriptural explanations that they include with those paragraphs so that you know some of the, the key talking points. All right, I'm going to read uh, paragraph 1441. Only God forgives sins. Right, that might also be a curveball to you. Only God forgives sins. Since he is the Son of God, Jesus says of himself, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And he exercises this divine power. And then they quote him saying from the scriptures, your sins are forgiven. Further, by virtue of his divine authority, he gives this power to men to exercise in his name. All right, and that's where we run into the trouble. Uh, for this, they cite John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. They, they put a lot of weight on that. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. So the mission of the apostles, and by extension, the mission of the priests, is itself a, an extension of the way that the Father has sent the Son. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Right, that's, the, that's the big tool in their arsenal uh, in talking about the sacrament of penance. <clears throat> the other one. I'll read the next paragraph in the Catechism, 1442. Christ has willed that in her prayer and life and action, his whole church should be the sign and instrument of the forgiveness and reconciliation that he acquired for us at the price of his blood. But he entrusted the exercise of the power of absolution to the apostolic ministry which he charged with the ministry of reconciliation. The apostle is sent out on behalf of Christ with God making his appeal through him and pleading, be reconciled to God. So again, it all comes back to apostolic succession. The priest is an apostle charged with the ministry of reconciliation, they say. And for this, they quote from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. We actually read this this morning uh, in the sermon. From now on, therefore, with regard, uh, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. All right, and here it's, in this case, it's a basic matter of interpretation. When we read this passage, who do we take the we and us to be? Who are the, the ministers of reconciliation? Well, that's, that's a church-wide thing. That's who we are as the church. Uh, that we have a ministry of reconciliation. We understand that, again, to be broadly. Catholics understand that to be narrowly applied just to the apostles and to their successors, the bishops and the priests. And so uh, they have the power of reconciling people to God. That's the explanation that they give. Um, you'll also want to look at James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Uh, that's another one that they cite for this. All right. Well, um, that is going to have to do it for tonight. Any questions or comments on that before we dismiss this evening? All right, so big question. I know we went long on it. Thank you so much for your, uh, your patience in that. And thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Uh, all right, well, if there's nothing else, then let us dismiss with prayer. Righteous Father, thank you for blessing us with our time together to consider this question and to equip ourselves to better be able to address 
our friends and neighbors and co-workers who, <clears throat> uh, who believe error, Father. And we pray, Father, that you help us in our discussions with them to lead them to the truth, because we know that your word is truth. We pray, Father, for grace as we speak uh, with people who disagree with us on these matters. We pray for patience, and we pray, Father, for an open heart on their part and on ours. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.